Hi, I'm Wes Wall, and we're here at Cheap Joe's in Boone, North Carolina on a blustery winter day. So it's a good day to be in the studio, and we're going to continue our conversations that we started a while back on watercolor painting and specifically all things that relate to wet into wet watercolor technique. Uh, if you want to research the Cheap Joe's YouTube channel, you'll find some of our previous video clips. Uh, we talked about some pretty important topics. One of the uh, very important things we discussed was stretching paper and how to adequately prepare your surface to take the intense pigment so that you get good rich color with watercolors. Uh, and you can find that clip on, on the video channel. We also talked about general studio setup in terms of location of your utilities, your blotter, your palette, and uh, creating things like a little angle board to get the, the proper angles on your watercolor painting if you're painting wet into wet. I talked a good bit also about, in one of the clips, some of the common problems that folks tend to encounter when they first take this challenge of learning to paint wet into wet. They're really fascinated with the process and the results, but uh, the learning curve may seem a little bit steep in the beginning. So we talk about some of those challenges in the previous videos. So I refer you to those uh, if you're interested and want to catch up with where we are currently in the uh, conversation. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics and provide you with an overview of brushes and brushwork. And there's always a lot of questions from participants of a workshop about brushes. Uh, what do I need to buy? How much do I have to spend? Uh, how many brushes do I need? And I think one of the, the issues there is uh, in that beginning phase of the learning curve with watercolor, we're all looking for magical solutions to make that learning curve a little less steep. And we're hoping that uh, maybe a magic brush does exist that helps kind of push us, propel us to a different level. Um, and I haven't found that yet. I haven't found that holy grail brush. Uh, maybe it's out there, and if, if so, I'm sure that Cheap Joe's will eventually make it and market it really well. But uh, knowing a good bit about our brushes uh, will reduce a lot of that anxiety and allow us to make some really good choices uh, to get the results that we want to have on our, happen on our paper. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. First, let's take a look at a painting. This is a scene, a landscape that I did quite a few years back um, in Aurora, Maine, which is near Grand Lake Stream in Maine. Uh, beautiful fishing country, and this is sort of a bold wash landscape with a lot of calligraphy and some real distinctive shapes. We've got the Aurora River flowing down through the middle of a cranberry, bro uh, cranberry bog, so we've got a lot of nice uh, reds and oranges in this, this painting. Now normally when we analyze or critique a painting uh, or ask questions about how to best create a painting, we're going to look at issues like value relationships, lights and darks, we're going to ask about color harmonies, uh, we're going to ask about general design and composition. I want us to ask a different question in relation to our topic today. What is the job of the brush or jobs of the brushes? Uh, the one thing I want to point out is that brushes do a couple important things, obviously a lot of important things, but one of the things we do with brush, brushes is to block in large shapes. And I kind of consider this a geometric way of thinking about uh, brushwork. So we have a large rectangular shape in the sky. We have a number of other washes that provide direction within the painting. Uh, and really what the brush is doing at some point is covering quite a bit of surface area in a uh, relatively short amount of time. We always have some dynamics going on with wet and to wet watercolor where uh, the paper is drying and we're trying to get certain processes accomplished before the paper reaches a certain level of dryness. So one thing we can say is that the brush is extremely important in establishing our big geometric shapes and patterns angular movement, that kind of thing. Secondly, what a brush does, it enables us to simulate or illustrate the organic qualities that occur in the symbols of the trees and the river. So, so we reproduce in some sense, if we're painting a uh, somewhat realistic painting, we reproduce nature. And that requires the job of uh, a special brush to simulate those pine needles and the, the rough textures and the, the linear kind of aspects of the branches, things like that. 
One of the other important jobs of a brush that we don't think as much about sometimes is to tie all these shapes together. Uh, you hear artists and watercolors in particular talk a lot about interlocking edges and lost and found edges. Well, the brush is critical in enabling us to unify this painting by, for example, pulling these shapes into one another, maybe with clear water, or possibly to create textures that overlap shapes, like in these little conifers down here and the, the trees coming up into the foreground. Uh, so in this sense, we have quite a few calligraphy marks, is what I refer to them as, uh, that help us to unify the painting, pull the shapes together, and add some interest uh, to the painting. So when we look at the painting from the brushes viewpoint, we see a number of important jobs. Now, the next question that, that folks ask is, how many brushes do I need and how much do I need to spend? We're going to address some of those topics today in detail and hopefully answer a lot of your questions so that you have a, a good frame of reference to be able to uh, make, make the purchases that you need to make and feel good about them. Let's step back in time a little bit uh, to the early 20s, the early 1900s and uh, 20s in watercolor in this country. One of the things I'm going to focus in on is say, let's just start with two brushes and talk about these, these on the, uh, the dissection table here. I've got a number 12 Cheap Joe's Dragon's Tongue brush made of Kalinsky sable with a nickel ferrule, beautiful deep uh, royal blue uh, finish. Uh, I have a one inch Magic Dragon Kalinsky sable brush, also Cheap Joe's. And if we look at the shape and form of these two brushes, uh, we can call these traditional watercolor brushes in the sense that uh, I think a majority of watercolorists beginning in this country to move into expressionistic and realistic watercolors, you would probably find these brushes uh, in their brush quiver, so to speak. If we go back to the early 20s, there was a watercolorist named George Ennis, George Pierce Ennis, who did beautiful paintings. He was from St. Louis, uh, somewhat large paintings, not as large as a full sheet for most of them. But he was uh, a tried and true proponent of the number 12 round brush. And in fact, made the bold statement that a number 12 round brush is all that is necessary. Edgar Whitney later added to his quote, a number 12 round brush is all that is absolutely necessary, uh, giving himself some leeway. But let's take a look at this brush in relation to, to making our paintings. We've got a, a good full body of Kalinsky sable and when the brush is wet you'll notice that, the, that it comes to a, a nice tip. Not extremely sharp but certainly a tip that can give us a good bit of fine line ability. Uh, one thing that folks will, will look at is if you look at a dry Kalinsky sable brush it looks a lot uh, less sharp at the end and then when you wet it the brush comes to a point. And it's important, and we'll talk about brush care later, but it's important to preserve the tip on that brush uh, when, you, when you paint and to take care of it properly. I've got a lot of rich color mixed up here on a little side palette. And let's take a look at uh, the performance qualities of a number 12 round brush. We have the ability to make very nice organic oblong type shapes with sharp edges. We have the ability to create a wash and pull clear water down into that wash. And it's surprising really how much ground surface area you can cover with a number 12 round brush. The other thing that we can do is we can uh, vary the pressure on the tip of the brush and create a fine line. More pressure, less pressure. So you see that we have the ability to create a lot of linear quality in, in our paintings. And you notice also that when I, when I create lines and calligraphy type strokes in, with the brush, I hold the brush perpendicular to the paper 
and sort of use an Asian hand form. I don't know if you can see that, but I brace the, the back of the brush with uh, my last two fingers there, my little finger, and hold it close to the top, and it gives me quite a bit of control. Practice that, and you'll be surprised at how much control you can get with the brush. A lot of folks tend to hold it like a pencil, and uh, believe it or not, it doesn't work quite as well. If I want to make some nice calligraphy type marks like you see in the foreground of that painting, I have the ability to do that by simulating some trees, branches, in a pretty quick fashion. And then also pull the body of the tree down into the painting. You see I'm not really doing a demo painting, but just showing you some of the characteristics and qualities this brush can reproduce. Um, so number, number 12 round is very versatile, and I think we can make a strong case for its uh, place as a primary tool in our watercolor kit. Uh, what kind of feeling and mood does, does using a round brush set? And I'll, I'll use an, one of my favorite painters, uh, Charles Reed, as an example. And uh, if we look at Charles Reed's book here, Watercolor Secrets, we see that uh, a lot of his work is done in plain air and it has a very loose and expressionistic quality, uh, almost what I would call a drippy pointillism. So one of the reasons I think that, that your typical round brush gained such popularity was that it was used in plain air painting as a primary tool for sketching, which is typically done on a relatively small piece of paper, uh, and it really puts into the painting some nice, diffuse, and not so tight qualities. One of the things that, that folks are constantly commenting, commenting on and aspiring to is some loose quality to their painting. And I don't think you'll find any uh, artist better than Charles Reed at demonstrating that in his work. Uh, so the virtues of the round, round brush are quite a few. And we also acknowledge that these brushes go up in size usually by two steps. From a number 12, we go to a 14 and a 16 and even 18 of which I have an example somewhere, maybe here's a size 18. So you see the difference in the size of the brush tip. And you see this brush is, this brush is dry. You see it looks quite different than the wet number 12 in terms of the tip. So again, remember always to wet your brush to get a view of uh, how sharp the tip can be pointed. Now, if you were gonna sell me on using only a number 12 brush, as George Ennis, the great watercolorist, prescribed, you're going to have kind of a hard time because there's another brush out here that, that I feel very strongly about as a staple for any watercolorist. And it's a brush that really tended to gain popularity in use, uh, particularly in the 30s and 40s with Elliot O'Hara and later Ed Whitney. Uh, and it's a one inch flat. So if I had to really be forced to pick which brush I would use if I could use only one, um, I'm going to probably lean toward a one inch flat because in my view it has so many virtues, uh, so many good qualities. This, as I mentioned, is a one inch flat Cheap Joe's Kalinsky Sable Magic Dragon. It's not an inexpensive brush and we'll talk about costs and, and some of the reasons for costs later on in the clips. Um, but let's look at what a one inch flat brush can do. We've mentioned in our painting that we've got a lot of surface area to cover in sort of a geometric fashion. And naturally this brush is already formed to a rectangular geometry in a sense. So it's following its natural characteristics if we want to block in large color and shape. So I'm gonna take some cobalt blue and I'm going to load this brush one thing I want to mention to you when, you when I refer to loading a brush is basically that's giving the brush time to fully saturate the fibers and pull in color until it's completely saturated. One of the mistakes folks often tend to make is they'll dip their brush in a puddle of color, swirl it around a little bit, and then go to directly to their paper. One thing I'd encourage you to do is to create a very good rich puddle of color and then give your brush some time to saturate. I always take a little time to damp off the base of the brush to pull excess water out, and now I have the ability, 
with this one inch flat to come in with some quite serious load carrying ability and create the geometric shapes of a sky, a pond, an ocean, a beautiful rich cobalt blue. Now that's virtue number one, the ability to make a straight edge as Whitney said with this brush or, to, or the ability for the brush to act as a straight edge. And it can do that in the fashion of a broad wash and it can also do that in the fashion of line. Line being one of our design tools that's very critical in most paintings. You can see that I can get, even with this very thick Kalinsky packed brush, a relatively thin line if I vary the pressure. So you've got a great ability to create geometric shape. One of the things as a landscape painter that I absolutely love about a one inch flat is that I can come in and again holding the brush somewhat near the tip with very little effort create some mountain shapes with great ease right on the edge of that lake there. a little cobalt and put a mountain there in the background. So beautiful ability to create geometric shape in a relatively quick fashion with sharp edges is again one of the, the great virtues of the one inch flat. Let's look at number three virtue. What else can this brush do that's so great? We could, we could pull this off with a, a number 12 round for sure, but I think you would acknowledge that we're going to have to do a lot more brush work to get that kind of smooth graded wash than we are uh, with, the, with the number 12 round than we are with this densely packed Kalinsky Sable brush. Uh, let's look at another feature that's nice about the one inch flat. Because the, the brush has so many dense fibers, and I've said this before, in my view this Magic Dragon is the finest one inch flat brush that I've, I've used because of the density of the Kalinsky fibers in the brush. It's, it's very tightly packed, but yet still gives us a pretty sharp edge. Um, because of that, when we make the brush thirsty, that means when I pull out the excess water, and I'm left with damp Kalinsky fibers, it serves as a great lifting tool and can pick up color in a pretty amazing fashion. So now I've got just a damp brush coming back into a damp wash and my ability to, to move that color off the, off the watercolor paper is, is pretty amazing. You can go down here into this area where it's a little wetter. Now here's another tip that I want to share with you. When, when we talk about lifting color, I want you to give the lifting process a little time as well. Just like loading the brush. A lot of times we come in and we start scrubbing around and then all of a sudden we've got an overworked area with a lot of brush marks and streakiness. Whereas if we take our time and let a damp brush sit for just a few seconds, 10, 15 seconds sometimes, you're going to find that it pulls up a significant amount of color using its own dynamics, I guess you could say. And I can go back over that a second round after that water has loosened even more pigment, pigment and pull up even more color. I can rinse and repeat this several times and I have the ability to get this big rectangular stripe almost back to its original paper. Not quite. I'm going to have a little bit of a stain there. But timing here is important. That I'm giving the time, I'm allowing the time for the brush to soak up the pigment 
rather than just taking the brush and scrubbing the pigment up. So the result there is that instead of a blotchy stamped out area, I have a nice soft lifted area and I hope you can see that. Another great advantage uh, of a one inch flat brush and, and this is uh, in, in Whitney's word, Ed Whitney's words, it uh, automatically keeps us from hem stitching. He was a great wordsmith, and hem stitching, uh, from the best I can tell, means over detailing and messing around and fiddling around so much with detail too early in the process. Because the brush is broad and uh, tends to be more suited for fairly large strokes, it's fairly difficult take this brush and start getting into overworking areas. We just find that it doesn't tend to work as well. Now it, we do have the ability to use it on its side and it somewhat mimics a round brush when we do that so we can get a nice round organic shape similar to what we got up here with the number 12 round. So a lot of versatility there. But in general it doesn't really provide us with the temptation like a number eight round would to start fiddling around with tree branches and trunks and details and birds before we need to, which is usually at the very end of a painting. And we also need to constantly remind ourselves to be judicious about not uh, over detailing our paintings. So in, in that sense, it keeps us somewhat loose and thinking on a large rectangular plane. So I've covered a lot of the, uh, the virtues, mark making, uh, we can also create calligraphy with a, num with a one inch flat, not too different than what we've created with the round. And one of the other qualities the brush has that gives a slight advantage is the ability to create texture within our painting. We can certainly create some texture with a round brush, but if we want to, for example, dry brush a foreground, we have the ability to lay the one inch flat on its side and quickly pull. You see that we've automatically created some, some really nice textural qualities there in a much broader larger surface area than we could with the, the number 12 round. If you do want to use a number 12 round for creating texture, you can certainly do so by turning the brush on its side and pulling out to the side. Nice for grasses in a field or foreground areas and connecting those shapes. So when I talk about using dry brush or creating texture, I go back to what I mentioned in the painting back here about knitting those larger shapes together with texture and special effects so that it unifies the painting, pulls the viewer's eye into the painting and, and avoids a lot of harsh uh, jumps that the eye has to make. It lets us make easy transitions, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, so in looking at... Uh, Looking at our discussion and back to the original question, how many brushes do I need? I've got two uh, brushes that I've shown you here that I would say are the number one and two choice of watercolorists if they have to be a minimalist. Now, what are the limitations here? I think back in the early days of watercolor uh, from my viewing a lot of paintings, Many of the paintings were of the size of a half sheet or a quarter sheet. Uh, the imperial size sheet of 22 by 30 uh, did not become uh, popular uh, as popular until the uh, eras of the 50s, the era of the 50s and 60s, uh, when folks started doing plain air in on larger sheets of paper. So naturally, if we look at creating a painting of this size, 22 by 30. And these are the only tools that we have. Uh, we're going to be working pretty hard. 
particularly if we're outside and it's a hot day and the paper is drying quickly and we're trying to get down basic washes uh, before they dry too quickly and become mottled and overworked looking. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to suggest is that we throw in a couple more brushes for you if you want to aspire to a larger 22 by 30 sheet of paper. I think these are fine if we want to stick to uh, half sheets or below, half sheets, quarter sheets, even 15 by 22 blocks. Uh, you can pull that off with just these two brushes. So if you want to be a minimalist, it's possible with these two brushes alone. But I would suggest if you want to move into larger watercolors and get good arm movement and large bold washes, that we're going to have to open up the cabinet a little deeper for you.